But this is the cry of my heart for you. Please show me your glory. Yes. I'm a teacher by nature and by training. And so you know that week after week as we come, we unpack the scriptures and we delve into them. You know what, and that's really good and it's really important, but there's sometimes a dynamic that we miss. And that's the heart. The heart that's crying out for God. Saying, God, I need you more than facts. I need you more than just simply a religious experience. <coughs> sure, I'm not sure how that got in there. <laughs> oh, what a good looking couple. You see, inside of me, there's a small man wanting to get out as well. Uh, it just hasn't succeeded yet. But have you ever been desperate? Have you ever had desperation? I read a story recently about two men who were out in the back sticks of the United States of America, right in the middle of nowhere, and they were hunting. And they'd been hunting, and they'd been so engaged in following deer that they uh, lost track of their bearings. And as the sun started to go down, they realized they were in trouble because they didn't know where they were, and they didn't know where to go. And so they began to panic because they realized that in the cold that they were enduring, that they wouldn't last the night. And so in desperation, they looked at each other and said, what do we do? So one of them had a, a brainwave and he said, I, I remember reading that if you fire three shots, that people understand that's a signal for distress and they will come and look for you. So his friend said, well, come on then, let's fire three shots. So they, they fired three shots and they waited half an hour and nothing happened. Now they're really getting desperate. He says, I think you need to fire another three shots. So the guy gets up and he fires another three shots and they wait another half hour and nothing happens. Eventually the one man turns to his friend and says, I don't think this is working. Yeah, his friend responded and we're losing all our arrows in the trees. <laughs> Only in America. <laughs> you know. But seriously, have you ever been desperately thirsty? Desperately thirsty. I was in patrol in the northeast of Rhodesia way back in about 1978. We'd been on patrol for some time. The weather was really hot and they'd been unable to resupply us with water. And we eked our water out for as long as we could, but we got to the place where we had no water left, and they couldn't get a resupply into us. We were in the middle of nowhere, and we were desperate. We'd done everything we can to try and find a river. Every river we came to was dry, and we were desperate. We, had, we dug down into the, into the sand, to, because often the water would go underneath, uh, and we dug down as far as we could go, and the sand didn't even get damp. And we were desperate. Eventually we climbed to the top of a high hill. And in Africa, a lot of them are just rocky outcrops in the middle of nowhere. We climbed to the top, and there, in the center of this rocky outcrop, there was a pool of water. But it was... Not water like you and I would normally drink. It had a thick green slime over the top. And it had water bugs. We call them uh, water boatmen skimming across the top of the water. What do you do when you desperate? We scooped the green away as much as we could and we drank the water. Because we were that desperate. And I'm here to prove that green water can be good for you. <laughs> it sort of stuck on my chin and has gone grey with age. But you know when you're desperate, you'll do anything. Are we desperate for God? Are we that desperate? 
desperate that we would seek God with the desperation of a person dying of thirst. The psalmist put it this way, he said, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. He's talking about a deep yearning, a deep longing after God. Now this isn't somebody who was far away from God. This is, this is David speaking. A man after God's own heart, a man who knew God, a man who enjoyed fellowship with God, and yet there was something within him that was just crying out after God. He wasn't satisfied with what he'd experienced. He wasn't satisfied with where he was. He wasn't satisfied with the revelations of God that he had. He wanted more of God. And he's saying, God, I'm desperate for you. You know what, I get concerned because I think as Christians, we are so ready just to settle for the, the little drops of God's goodness instead of pressing in and pressing on and seeking after God with all of our heart to experience the fullness of what He wants to reveal to us of who He is. A.W. Tozer stated that we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. We are so preoccupied with everything else in our world. You know what, even as Christian and in churches, we are so preoccupied with other things. We're preoccupied with the worship. We are preoccupied with the music. We are preoccupied with the style. We are preoccupied with the culture. We are preoccupied with everything else. But our preoccupation isn't with God Himself. And so we find that we leave with empty hearts and, and a longing and a desperation within us that cries out after the living God. Because we've been to church, but we haven't met with Him. That's it. That's it. People, we need Him. I heard an interesting story about a pastor who had a young man come to him and say, you know, I really want to know God, but I, I don't understand what desperation after God is all about. So the pastor said, I'll tell you what, I'll meet you down at the beach tomorrow morning and I'll explain it to you. So they met down at the beach and the pastor took him out into the waves. And when they got far enough, he grabbed the young man by the back of the neck and put his head under the water and he just held him there. Eventually, after about a minute and a half, he let him up. And this young man gospel breath and he struggled and he spat out water and he said, what did you do that for? He says, desperation is what you felt for air. Yes. That's the level of desperation we need to have after God. Not simply satisfied with the fact that, oh well, I'm going to heaven one day. You know, that's not enough. God wants to bless you here and now. God wants to reveal Himself to you now. God wants to pour His reality out upon you now. He wants you to experience some of heaven on earth now. And it's got to come to the place where you and I are so desperate for that that we'll lay aside our preoccupation with everything else that distracts us from Jesus. Oh, well, did you see? We were laughing at David. Sorry, David. <laughs> Joe was uh, smiling at him. They were practicing that first song. And it went a little high. And as Dave was playing it and trying to hit the high notes, his eyebrows just disappeared in his head. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, we're so bad, sorry, Dave. <laughs> but you and I can relate to that. You know, we're really trying to get there. Desperate. Desperate. So easy to be critical of everything and everybody else. But you know, people, it's not about church. It's not about the pastor, it's not about the leaders, it's about meeting with God. So that's why we come today, not to sing some choruses or hymns. We, we got a text early this morning from someone saying, is church on, we don't have power. I want you to know we're going to have church on whether there's power or not, as long as God's on. Because that's what it's about, isn't it? It's not about whether we sing. It's not about whether we stomp our feet or roll our eyes and, and, and 
and raise our hands and pay root around in, in circles. It's about God that is important. And my heart is just yearning and crying out after God. And so we come to a man like Moses, a man who had experienced God in so many ways, a man who spoke to God face to face, which is more than you and I have ever done. A man in the Old Testament who had experiences with God that were absolutely phenomenal. And listen to what he's saying in Exodus 33, 18. He's saying, Moses said, please show me your glory. Or please show me what I've had isn't enough. I need so more, much more. You see, we need more than secondhand religion. Exodus 33, 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Did you know that there was only one man in the whole of Scripture who never had parents, other than Adam? It was Joshua, because he was the son of Nun. <laughs> but you see, the reality is that although, although Moses had the blueprints for the temple, the tabernacle, God had given it to him. They hadn't set that up yet. And while he was up on the mountain, what happens? The people of Israel look around and say, hey, you know what, we're a little bored. Moses has not been around for a little while and, and we're not quite sure what to do. So how about we make a golden calf like the ones they used to worship back in Egypt and we'll just make it, we'll bring all our gold together, we'll make this and we'll worship like we did it. We'll call this gold calf God. And so Moses comes down from the mountain and he is angry and God is angry beyond all measure. And here in these verses... We hear that in their midst was the reality of God, but they were prepared to settle for a golden calf. You know, people, we are so ready to settle for less. Something that's more convenient. Something that's easier. Something that isn't as demonic. Something that doesn't take all my commitment and time. It's so easy for us. To settle for second best. To get into religion where we go through the motions and I attend church because that's what I'm supposed to do. For goodness sake, stop attending church and start meeting with God. What we want to do is come together as a family to inspire and encourage one another in our journey and our discovery of God. This tent was a physical sign of God's presence among us. And yet it wasn't enough. It was a place for getting direction. Scripture says that whenever they needed to know what to do, they would go to this place and God would show them what to do. What an awesome thing to have. And yet they would still settle for a gold car. It was a place that was sacred. The presence of God came down on that tent in a way that just was phenomenal. And you know, it was so powerful that the Israelites stood and worshipped in the camp at the side of it, but they'd settle for a gold calf. It was a place separated from the camp. It wasn't part of their everyday life. It was something that they had to make an effort to do or to go to. But it was a place of intimacy with God. A place where God would meet with people face to face. Moses face to face. You know what? Sometimes the effort is worth it. That's it. Sometimes the effort is worth it. So often we get up and race to church. Where's our heart preparation for me? 
taken time to just be in His presence so that when we come, we're not coming to seek God, but we're coming in the fullness of God. To be a blessing to those around us. You see, church has become so much a part of what we do. And so little of it is about God and our relationship and growing. It wasn't a place for second-hand worship. This is the tragedy for me. Here Moses is. He goes into the tent. The cloud comes down. And while Moses enjoyed the reality of God's presence, the people worshipped from afar. Isn't that tragic? They worshipped from afar. It was never God's plan for people to worship from afar. Right from the very outset, God had invited the people of Israel to meet him at Mount Sinai. And that he would meet with them, that he would show them his presence in a way that would challenge and change them. And they were to prepare themselves for three days for that encounter. And you know what? They prepared themselves for three days for the encounter. And when they went up to Sinai and they went to meet with God, the presence and the power and the awesomeness of God was so overwhelming. They were so afraid. They said to Moses, you speak to God and we'll listen to what you say. And you know what, for me, that's the biggest cop-out in history. It's for people to step back and say, oh, well, you know, this is all a little too intense. It's a little too difficult. It's a little too challenging. You do it and you tell me what God says. People of God, God wants you. He doesn't want me. <laughs> Fortunately, He does want me too. But you know what, we're here because God loves us. And he wants a personal relationship with us. He doesn't want us to be worshipping from afar. He doesn't want us to be standing in the gates of our, or the, the doorways of our, of our tents, worshipping from afar while a certain few get together and go right into the presence of God and worship. And you know what? We can be so inspired by them, can't we? If we see that them just get so wrapped up in the presence of God that they, 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 they shine. And there's joy in their face and there's just such excitement in them. And you know what? We, we really want what they want, but we're not prepared to pay the price that they pay to be close to God. Let us not be content to worship from afar. We know the veil was torn in two, but so often we worship outside the veil. So often we still worship from the outer courts when God has invited us into the throne room of heaven itself. You may think I'm weird, it's okay, I am. But the reality is when lost, were you in a time of worship where the presence of God was just so powerful that you wept? Just overcome by His presence in a way that you couldn't give expression. That's what God wants to do for us. He doesn't want to dwell afar or off. He wants us to draw near. They were satisfied to meet, to let Moses meet with God and then report on his experience. You know what? So often we have times where people share what God has done in their lives and it's really exciting. But you know what? Every one of us should be queuing up to talk about what God's doing. It shouldn't be just a handful, just the ones and twos. Because God wants to be part of your everyday experience. Moses was a God chaser, not a storm chaser. <laughs> storm chasers become a great program on American television. People who will chase storms dangerous, but the thrill is what drives them. Show ended eventually because a man 
who'd been on their show for many, many years, Tim Samaras, was killed by a storm. And they closed the show down. But you know what? He was prepared to pay the price. You know what I really did? My heart cried out and said, God, help me to be willing to pay the price. To be a God chaser. Not to be sufficient with anything less. You see, Moses wanted more than an angel. And in Exodus 33, after they have built the golden calf and they've been worshipping it, God is angry with them. He removes his presence from among them. And he says to them, I will send an angel before you to bring you to the land that I promised. I'll send my angel. And Moses says, Verse 15 of Exodus 33. <coughs> if your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. God, if you're not going to go with us, if you're not going to lead us, if you're not going to take us by the hand and bring us through, then God, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to stay right here with you. So often we're prepared to settle for an angel. But if we want more of God, then we've got to learn to be desperate. Teach me your way so that I may know you. You know what? Teach me your ways, O oh God. the cry of a God chaser. John Bun Bunyan put it this way, he said, Moses was rather for dying where he stood than to go one step without God. And I wonder if we just have to become a little blase in our current Christian experience where we meet up with God on occasions and that's pretty exciting, but we're quite happy to go our own way. God is moved by our need of Him. You see, God withdrew His judgment and promised to be their leader and protector. Why? Because Moses cried out to God. He said, God, if you're not going to go with us, we're not going anywhere. And because of His sincerity, because of His hunger for God, God was willing to do what He was. And He says that He says, I will do what you you see, we could be crying out to God for each other. It's not something my job to cry out for you. It's our job to cry out for each other. Oh God, let your presence come. Let your glory be revealed. Lord, show yourself to you. Moses wouldn't settle for second best. You wouldn't settle for an angel. You'd only settle for God. Please, God, show me your glory. Probably one of the most presumptuous prayers prayed in a while. Think about it for a moment. Moses had been with God on Mount Sinai. He'd met with him face to face. God had given him the Ten Commandments and two tablets of stone. Moses had seen the burning bush and he crossed the flooded river and had seen the enemies of God destroyed. He, he saw the terrible plagues and the provision of, of God's manna and water from a rock. Moses met with God face to face and attended and talked with him as a friend. Yet Moses wanted more. And my cry is, oh God, create within us a thirst, a desire, an appetite for more of you than we've ever, ever experienced before. God, I want to see your glorious presence. I want to see more than your finger writing on the stone. I want to see more than, and hear more than a voice from a cloud or a bush. God, I want to see you. 
And when he encountered God, God makes the rules. I love this. Because God looks at him and says, tell you what, Moses, you really want to have an encounter with me? You come tomorrow. We're not going to do it right now. That's not my time frame. My time frame is you come tomorrow. And you stand on this place and there's a, there's a, a hollow in the rock. He said, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in that hollow and I'm going to put my hand over you and I'm going to let my glory pass in front of you. And once my glory has passed, I will take my hand away and you will be able to only see my back. Because no one can see me and live. I love that. And so he gets up and he goes to meet with God. When we encounter God, he reveals his character. Matthew, Exodus 34. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. You see, when we really encounter God, we begin to understand who he is. Not here, but here. And that's what changes us forever. When we encounter God, we respond in worship. In Exodus 34 verse 8 it says, Moses bowed to the ground and worshipped. You see, when we come into that place where God's presence is so tangible that we can feel Him among us, there is nothing we want to do more than bow in worship before Him. I love what the Scripture says. When He says, please show me your glory, God says, I'll let you see my back. The, the Hebrew word for back is an anthropomorphic representation, which means that the writer is representing God in human terms so that we can try and understand it. But the actual Hebrew word is not used in any other place to describe a back. It's used to describe the afterglow. So what God said is, Moses, you can't stand to see me. I know you want to, but, but you can't. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over you. And when my glory is past, I'll just let you see the glow of what's left behind. Have you been in a dark room with a light and somebody switches out the light and in your, in your mind you can still see that light? That's what he was saying. I'm going to show you the after God. After it's gone, I'm going to just show you a little touch. And you know what really, really challenged me? Is just seeing the afterglow <coughs> of God's glory <coughs> causes His face to be radiant with the glory. Radiant with the glory. Moses was changed by his encounter. So they were the same again. You see, if, if you seek God, if you want more, Scripture says you will find Him. God isn't hiding. God isn't trying to make it difficult for us. But what He is saying to us is if you're sincere and you really want to know me, I'll make myself clear to you in ways that will blow your mind. If you really want it. If you look for me wholeheartedly, God says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will find me. Moses' prayer, please show me your glory. God promises to do that if we will seek him. If you encounter him, you will reflect his glory. People will be able to see it in you. You remember the apostles before the Sanhedrin? looks at them and says, these are unlearned men. But they took note that they been with Jesus. There's something about these guys. Isn't our world looking for that? The reality of the glow of the glory of Christ. 
God and the lives of his people. They're not interested in religion. They're not interested in the system of belief. And they're not interested in going through the motions. They're looking for a reality in God that we are not demonstrating for them clearly enough. To reflect his glory, some people will be critical. Remember in the book of Acts, chapter 16 and, and verse 15. Stephen is in front of the same evening. And he looks up and he sees Jesus. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices they all rushed to them, dragged him out of the city and began to stone. You see, being a God changed, the chaser is not popular. It's not popular with the world because we shine with a light that only God can give. And it exposes wickedness without saying a word. It's just the goodness of God in us. But you know what? God chases are often despised too by Christians who experience less and feel challenged by those who experience more. And so we tend to look at them and say they just crack pots. We tell you it's a crack pot, I want to be a cracked pot for Jesus. Hallelujah. That his glory would shine through this cracked pot. And that people would see the glory of the God that I know. So, many will call you fanatics, many will call you crazy. We've got to learn to keep chasing God. Do you really want more of God? Is it considered Moses' passion for God and the reality of his presence? Perhaps this morning we've realized that we've grown comfortable with a mediocre experience of God that we've been going through the motions. I'm not saying we haven't been living in a relationship, but a minimal relationship with Him. Perhaps you've been content to worship at a distance. My prayer is that you won't settle the second least anymore. And that God would create with you. A desire, a longing for him that you can't contain. Perhaps today you, you aren't even a Christian, a Christ follower, but more than of, from life than simply existing and wondering what happens when you die. Perhaps you want more than putting on a good face and playing religion and going through the motions. Perhaps you've tried that and look, honestly, it will never satisfy. There's nothing that satisfies except God. You can sing, you can clap, you can laugh, you can dance, you can do what you like, but you cannot replace the reality of God in life. Becoming a Christian and a Christ follower and a God chaser is very simple. We've got to start by admitting. Admitting that we need it. That we're in the graveyard and we can't get out of the grave by ourselves. Not even if somebody puts their hand on our shoulder and frightens us mightily. I've got to admit that we've broken God's law. Admit that within me dwells no good thing. I've got to believe. I've got to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for my wrongdoing 
so that I could have a face-to-face -face relationship with him. Not a relationship at a distance, not a relationship on a Sunday, but a relationship with God who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord who gives us victory. I've got to believe that. I've got to believe that God wants that. I've got to ask. In our self-sufficient world, asking is a real challenge sometimes. Isn't it? We don't want to admit that we can't managed by ourselves. Do you know what? Until you ask of God, you'll never know what forgiveness is all about. When you ask God to forgive you, He gives you a whole new start. And then you've got to surrender. This is the hard part. It means you've got to lay down everything you want, everything you believe, and everything and embrace what God says is good. And sometimes they fly in the face of each other. They are totally opposed to me. And that's where we struggle the most. I think we can admit that we're sinners because we know we're broken human beings. We can believe that Jesus died. We can ask for forgiveness. Those are the three easiest steps for this one is the one that keeps us from being a God chaser. Is when I'm prepared to surrender everything in my life that keeps me away. Are you desperate for Him? Is your innermost being reflecting the words of Moses? Lord, please show me the glory. If so, during the closing song as the team leads us why don't you just take some time with him maybe put some things right maybe deal with some stuff if you need help there are going to be people up at the front who'd love to pray with you but you know what this is between you and God it's looking to him it's asking him to reignite your passion and to show you his glory. That's what I want more than anything else. It's good to be back here at here church. But you know what? God is here. God is everything. We don't need to come here to encounter God. We can encounter Him anywhere. As you go back to your churches, visitors, seek God in the times of worship. Seek God with all of your heart. Pray that He will make Himself real to you in all. And he will. For us here at Pahia Baptist Church, it's learned to be passionate about seeking God. It's learned to come with a hunger each week that God will show us his glory. How about coming early and maybe just sitting in your chair and just crying, asking God to meet with us? Maybe God would prompt you to come in early and just to go around and pray over every seat. That every person who comes would encounter you know, honestly, I don't care whether they go away and say if we have good worship or not. Really doesn't bug me. I'm not going to worship you. <laughs> it doesn't bug me if they go away and say there was a good preacher or not. It really doesn't. 
doesn't work. I want people to go away and say, God was in their lives. I had a God encounter there. It made me hungry for you. That's my heart for us as we journey into the rest of this year. Is that we won't get so caught up in the mechanics of Christianity. And we forget the heart. And we've got the heart.